The Knowledgeable Provider podcast is intended primarily to entertain, also to inform, but it is not a substitute for actual medical training and should not be used by anyone to diagnose or treat any medical condition in themselves or others. If you need medical advice, please make an appointment to see your own knowledgeable medical provider. The opinions expressed by me and anyone else who happens to appear on the podcast are solely those of the people expressing them and are not necessarily representative of any other entities. Other than the lunches at the office, I do not receive any sort of compensation from pharmaceutical or medical device companies, and I have no other relevant financial disclosures. Look, this is all for fun, okay? Don't sue me. All right, on with the show. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Knowledgeable Provider. I'm your host, Jody Marks. Today's episode is an interview with a former coworker, Mr. Luke Pike. Luke's been a paramedic for 25 years, and for 18 of those worked at HIMSI. Currently, he works as a patient care tech in the emergency room at Huntsville Hospital. He's also a member of the National Guard. He's been a combat medic for 23 years, has served two combat tours in Iraq, and two support tours in adjacent countries. His wife, Debbie, is a nurse practitioner. Their daughter, Suzanne, holds a math degree from the University of Alabama. Their son, Blake, went to Vanderbilt on a Navy ROTC scholarship, finished a degree in chemical engineering, then commissioned into the Navy and is now stationed in Japan. And unfortunately, their son Tyler battled depression and died by suicide a few years ago. Honestly, I was a little uncomfortable about including that, but it was very important to Luke that Tyler not be left out, and it's important to him that people know how Tyler died. Today, Luke and I are discussing tachycardia, specifically narrow complex tachycardia, meaning either SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, or atrial fib with rapid ventricular response, AFib with RVR, commonly called. Luke has a pretty unique perspective on this because, of course, he's treated patients with it as a medic, but he's also experienced it as a patient himself. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while, and I hope you enjoy it. Luke Pike, welcome to Knowledgeable Provider. Thanks so much for your time, man. I've been looking forward to it. Uh, Thanks for having me, Jody. I really miss working with you. I know. I miss you, too, man. I've, I've really been looking forward to just talking to you. First off, thank you for all of your service. I mean, military, civilian, gosh, you've you've done more for more people for longer than any group of, you know, 10 people would be expected to do. So uh, in all seriousness, thank you. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you for your support. Oh, yeah. that We throw that term around, you know, thank you for your service. But uh, in all seriousness, my hat's off to you. So we're here to talk about tachycardia. And you have a pretty interesting perspective on that being on both sides of the both sides of the electric fence on that situation. Uh, yes, I do. You want to talk about it? You want to just give kind of an overview of, of where we start with narrow complex tachycardia? Narrow complex tachycardia, you know, is just generally anything that is referred to as something where the complex is like really close together in that QRS. Uh, you're, you know, within the, uh, what is it, like 0.08. And it is so fast that generally, if you're looking at it, you have no ability to tell if it is going to be like AFib with RVR or SVT. I do have one exception to that. There was a doctor that I worked under as a paramedic student at Coleman Regional. His name was Dr. Eccles. We put this person on the monitor and Dr. Eccles goes in and listens to their heart and says, they're in AFib, we need to fix this. Now, this person had a heart rate of like 200. Wow. What just astounded me was once we got the 12 lead, Dr. Eccles was right. The patient was in AFib with RVR, you know, so that that 12 lead is going to determine because, you know, it can measure that electrical activity way better than the human eye can see it. It's very challenging to tell when it's that fast, whether it's AFib or SVT. And I don't know. I don't know how you would do that with a stethoscope, really. I mean, he did have a 50-50 shot. (laughs) He, he was a very old school doctor and he was very knowledgeable. I learned a lot from him, especially cardiac, because he knew his stuff. He knew what was going on and he, you know, knew how to handle it when it happened. It was quite weird, you know, because, you know, when we go through paramedic training, it's like, well, you're not really going to know if it's AFib or, uh, you know, SVT, you know, unless you do the 12 lead. And Dr. Eccles walked right in there and, put his stethoscope on, listen for like 30 seconds and says, hmm, AFib. That's very cool. 
I hope everybody still gets the chance to learn from the the old school folks who have been around for forever because you can pick up a lot from from people like that. Oh, that you can. The wealth of knowledge is out there. You just got to be able to open your ears, listen, and actually want to learn. Because if you don't, then I mean, you're really letting yourself down and you're letting your patients down as far as, you know, treatment and care. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. But yeah, when it's when it's super fast, it is so hard to tell. And sometimes it's even hard to tell if it's narrow or wide. I mean, sometimes VTAC and SVT really look the same when it's fast enough, you know. I mean, you know, you get that VTAC. I mean, it's going to have to be extremely fast to narrow that complex. I haven't seen VTAC per se. I had one patient who one time had Corsades, kind of looked like VTAC. He went unresponsive and I'm like, hmm, this could be VFib. But just because it started so quickly that the complexes are so wide at the moment, you know, so he got a shock and converted. Awesome. It was a defib shock. It wasn't a synchronized cardio version. I charged uh, 200 and gave it to him and then he was, you know, right back with us. You want to talk about some of your other experiences treating patients just as a, as a paramedic, as a provider? I've only had one that I had to cardiovert. And I only did that on a doctor's orders. I was working with uh, Britt Birdwell. He was the uh, Bravo 300 for Hemsey. We got dispatched over to uh, the little old folks high rise behind the Costco there off of the parkway. Is that Presbyterian Towers? That's probably it. I, I do believe that is. And so lady goes unresponsive. She has a heart rate, but no respirations. Fire gets on scene. They're bagging her. We get her down to their truck. We uh, get her intubated, and we're en route to the hospital. And her heart rate's like 140. Everything else is good, you know, because we've controlled her airway. So I call a report to the hospital at Huntsville, and Dr. Murphy is the doctor at the time. And I gave her all the info, told her the heart rate, sent the 12 lead that we did, and she says, "Let's go ahead and cardiovert." So I immediately repeated. Everything that I just said to Dr. Murphy. And she goes, yeah, let's cardio work. All right. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> you, doctor's orders. You know, so <laughs> we we cardioverted the patient. She immediately became awake and started, you know, responding. Heart rate didn't drop, you know, all that much. I mean, probably went down to like 120. And when I got there, my first question was, I gave you all the information. Vitals were stable. Heart rate was this. Patient unresponsive. Patient innovated. What was your reasoning behind having me cardiovert this patient? And she's like, well, we're starting to see SVT at lower heart rates. And I just wanted to see what happens. Okay. And I was like, well, uh, what happened was she woke up. Heart rate didn't change a lot. But, you know, she was currently awake after that and could follow commands and all that. So it was... An interesting experience. You know, I didn't let that go by without repeating and double checking, you know, exactly what she wanted. Yeah, that's a big deal when you're actually going to push that button to shock somebody who has a pulse. Yes. Any other things that you can remember as far as your experience as a, a medic doing that? Not really had a lot of interaction with SVT. I mean, it's kind of like quicksand. You know, when you're a kid, they always taught you quicksand was just going to be just horrible thing that was going to consume your life. Right. Well, just like as a medic, SVT may or may not come along very much in your career. I've only had one other experience. Uh, picked up a patient from Redstone Arsenal at Fox Army. They were having kind of like some SVT. And I called and I asked, it's like, hey, can I cardiovert? Sent the 12 lead. The doctor looked at it, and, and when I called in my report, they're like, well, we don't really know. And so we're not going to let you cardiovert. And I can't remember who the doctor was because this was literally like when the trauma bays were directly inside the ER doors. Right. It's been a minute since this happened. My only thing that just really saved me on this was when we rolled the patient into the trauma room, and we picked them up with the sheet and plopped them on the ER bed, they immediately converted to a sinus rhythm. Oh, perfect. Yeah. But the ER doc, she's like, well, 
I looked at it. I didn't really know if it was SVT. And I was like, well, I mean, kind of was. He was symptomatic. You know, he was having, you know, low blood pressures. He had the elevated heart rate. He was diaphoretic, kind of looking a little pale. And I described all that in the, the radio report and was still denied. Right. Sure. When I plopped them over and they converted, that was the best thing ever for me. I bet. <laughs> I think I've only ever cardioverted somebody once. It was it was toward the very end of my time as a medic uh, when I was working very part time. So when something long something like that comes along, you're not doing it every day. It's even scarier, you know. Right. It was way out in Triana. The guy was clearly sick. Heart rate was super high. And I, I think he was septic. I don't think the you know, looking back, I don't think the heart rate was really the problem. But he was, you know, unstable. And so I called and I got orders for a denison. And the doctor just happened to say, make sure you're ready to shock him. <laughs> and so we get in the, we get in the kit and there's no fucking adenosin, which is, you know, I guess my own fault. Apparently I didn't check the truck off well enough, but somebody had used it out of the kit and it wasn't replaced. And so now here I am going, well, he kind of said I could cardiovert him. So I gave him some, I guess, verse, did we have versed? I don't remember. No, probably at, at that point in time, the only thing we would have had would have been Valium. We wouldn't have had the uh, verse at Hemsey if that's where you were working at. Yes. Okay. Oh, I gave him something and shocked him. And uh, he didn't actually react to it that much. Maybe the pre-medication helped. But yeah, that was my only experience ever doing it, really. Can you talk about a denison? Can you talk about what it's like giving a denison and how that process goes? I can't really say that I've ever given a denison on the ambulance. I have watched another medic give it. And as you know, you know, from our previous conversations, I have been on the receiving end of a denison. Yeah. It is a very interesting experience because your brain is very sensitive to oxygen levels. And when they push that adenosine and you tell your patient, when I push this, I'm going to push it fast and hard, you're going to feel weird. And that is exactly true because the minute your heart goes into that weird arrhythmia as the adenosine is working, your brain is not very happy that is not receiving all the oxygen that it is used to. And so it is a weird feeling. You know, you kind of get short of breath, you know, just because your body says, hey, the heart quit beating. What are we going to do now? But then it comes back and, and it clears up pretty quickly. I went from having it and within like three to four seconds, you know, was back to normal. I bet that's a long three or four seconds. Uh, it it can be. And that was just the six. You know, they also gave me the twelve. And you know that they've, you know, stopped the third dose of 12, you know, so now when you do a denison, you just do the six and 12. And, you know, if you haven't converted by then, then they're looking at the cardio version. I've given it a few times and uh, I know that interval, you know, when you watch the heart kind of stop and then you're waiting for it to start. That's a very long time from the other side of it. I can't even I can't even imagine when it's your heart doing it. My thing is, is like I've seen it done. And, you know, as a person who's supposed to be able to give it, it was interesting and very informative to feel what the effects are to know. And, you know, as far as, you know, what the medicine is going to feel like, I am not happy that I have the medical problem I have, but that I actually got to experience what I would subject patients to. The more I work in medicine, the more I think you can't really understand a medical issue until you have it or until you talk to somebody who has it, you know, you can read about it in the textbook all you want, but you don't really know until you have experienced it. Correct. Can you talk about the difference in treating patients in this kind of situation in in civilian versus military settings? I have no idea about combat medicine or how any of that works. So combat medicine is focused on point of care injury treatment. So basically, we as combat medics or as even just a regular soldier, if anything happens when we're in combat, the first thing is, is that the patient is secondary. So like if we were to receive fire, a patient gets injured, our immediate duty is to provide overwhelming and suppressive fire to stop the enemy. A lot of people don't like it, but... The patient bleeding out is the secondary thing at that time. If they receive a extremity wound, then they're equipped with a a tourniquet and they're supposed to provide self-care, self-aid, and start doing any medical care. 
If anybody suffers cardiac arrest, it's almost kind of like triage for civilian to an extent, but we're a little more severe. You know, if we're in combat and you go into cardiac arrest, you're not breathing, then you are considered black. You know, at no point will we do any interventions such as mouth-to-mouth, BVM, CPR, or anything like that. In combat, if you are injured to the point where you're not breathing or we don't think you have a pulse, then you're considered deceased and you're black on the tag. You know, it's just, it's more harsh and severe, but, you know, for us in the military, it is mission first. And then once we've accomplished the mission, then we will triage and take care of all casualties as we see fit. But, you know, if you're forward, what chance does a person who requires CPR, how are they going to live to get to a combat support hospital? And that's kind of what we have to look at. You know, your yellows and reds get the priority treatment. Your greens, you know, who are the walking wounded, they're classified, you know, as delayed. But combat medicine versus civilian medicine, there's kind of a stark difference. You know, we we kind of really have to set the line and say, we're in the middle of bullets flying around. We really can't be doing this. We have something else that we're concerned with so that other people don't die. And in civilian, you know, you don't have that. Your, your total point is that, you know, this person called. I arrived at their scene. They have my complete attention. And I will do everything I can to make sure they have a good outcome. And unfortunately, in the military, that is not going to be the case, depending on the circumstances. Now, if it was non-combat, you know, we would do everything we can. We would call in medevac. We would airlift the soldier and all that. But for us, we have the combat aspect, whereas civilian, you know, generally you don't. You know, that's kind of where you, you walk that line of, of that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. There's a news story just this morning that a HMZ ambulance got shot at over on Beard Street. Oh, I did not see that. I just read that this morning. Somebody shot right through the radiator. Yeah, well, I mean, Beard Street, I can see that, unfortunately. Yeah, so hopefully that would never be a consideration in civilian land, but I guess uh, not 100% guarantee. Well, no, it, it's not. 20 years ago, I used to work in uh, Decatur. I worked for Decatur EMS for about a year. There was a subdivision, you know, with lower income people that you would not, as a ambulance or a firefighter on a fire truck, go into this without not having at least three police cars to escort you in, to protect you, and then escort you out. You know, and I I know that's 20 years ago, but I mean, it's still kind of weird that People would actually shoot at people who just have no inclination to detain you or only there to help you survive whatever has occurred to you. But yet, you know, their thing is, it's like, oh, well, they're part of the government. They must be part of the the problem. So, you know, let's shoot at them. Yeah, it's terrible. It's crazy that civilian folks have to put up with that at all. Would you have all the same capabilities or would you have more capabilities as far as the adenosine and the cardioversion, like for, for a tachycardia situation? Would the actual treatment be the same if you were in a situation where you could provide that treatment? For me, it seems how I am just a combat medic. The military does not recognize like my paramedic skills per se. So technically, my job is just combat medic, which equates to pretty much like an advanced EMT on the civilian side. There are paramedic uh, medevacs where they have the monitors, they have the drugs, and they actually carry blood products. So you will have paramedics, you know, as soldiers flying out to patients and being able to give blood products. Cardiovert, start IVs, give, you know, all kinds of medicines. But those are specialized units. In the military, you know, we all work under, the, it's kind of like civilian We work under providers as well. So at some point, somewhere in our chain of command is a doctor who says that we can do this and, you know, that's it. So these flight paramedics, you know, who are on the Medifax, they will have all the drugs and be able to do all this stuff. But the military is kind of now shifting because when we were in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
we had air superiority. We controlled the air. Our helicopters and airplanes could fly anywhere and land to evacuate medical patients. Our focus now is because that we're going into what we call a near-peer situation, which would be like Russia and China. Those assets, you know, they have anti-aircraft capabilities where they can shoot down aircrafts. So now the Army is transitioning from this rapid response of evacuating a soldier to now they're starting to train combat medics to hold patients at almost an ICU level at times. That is, you know, kind of the kind of the training they're pushing because you may be starting an IV. You may have to intubate the patient. You may have to pay, say, Foley catheter. This is stuff that they're starting to push out to these medics that you may not be able to get this patient, you know, off your site within an hour. You may have to hold them for a day or two. We may have to send a ground transport to pick this patient up because we're unable to fly. So the the military is kind of transitioning to this because we expect our next conflict to be within China or Russia, somebody who has capabilities almost identical to ours. So our medical focus has had is going to change and they're starting to push this out through AMED, which is the the medical source out of San Antonio for all of the medical within the uh, army military. Man, that's that's really interesting. A lot of medics are going to have to really, you know, step up their game and learn to monitor and continually assess their patients for probably hours on end. They're also pushing out where they can have doctors who are on call, like these medics can call in and the doctor can advise them what needs to occur for a patient because the medical describe get the vitals, the symptoms injuries. And then a doctor will say, hey, well, it sounds like this is going on. This is what you need to do. They're not completely isolated, but I mean, they're not going to have a nurse or a doctor there with them. It's going to be an advanced EMT doing all of this stuff for a patient till they can be evac'd out. Let's go on to your experience as a patient, talking about the whole tachycardia situation. How did that come about? When's the first time that you experienced something like that? Probably started about Two years ago, I uh, started having elevated heart rates. I have a little Apple Watch, and I wasn't really having symptoms other than like if I was sitting there, I would I would not even know I was in any type of arrhythmia. But like if I got up and walked, and it's like, man, you know, this this walking kind of made me a little tired. But you know, there was no paleness. I never got diaphoretic. Never really got short of breath. It's just like if I was walking, it's like. It was almost like I was walking uphill and it's like, what's going on? My first episode that I had it, I was out mowing my lawn and I was just like, man, this, this lawnmower is really getting hard to push. So I go in and I sit down for a minute and I'm like trying to feel for my pulse and I can't feel my pulse. And at that time, my wife, she's the one that had the little Apple watch that had the little ECG feature in it. I put her watch on and I like do it and it's like, Oh, my heart rate's 190. Wow. So I start doing like all, you know, all the typical vagal maneuvers, trying to get it down. And I'd like, look, I said, you're going to have to take me to Huntsville to get treatment for this because I'm not symptomatic now. But I think if my heart rate stays at 190, we're going to have some issues in a couple hours. You would think, yeah. <laughs> so he takes me to the to the hospital and drops me off. and. I walk in, I get checked in, and they put me on the pulse ox, immediately take me back to a room in uh, APOD, you know, hook me up to the monitor. And one of the nurses goes like, well, I'm going to go grab the adenosine. And as soon as she walked back in to the room with the adenosine, converted. Great timing. (laughs) Went, Went down to like 120, hung out, you know, for like 120 for like an hour and then kind of dropped down and all that. And Went uh, last year to Norfolk to see my son because he was finishing up classes because he's in the Navy and he was deploying to Japan for his two year deployment. Had an episode there, you know, kind of same thing. It's like, uh, no, no diaphoresis, no shortness of breath, just kind of felt tired. So I got up, 
took him to his base to drop him off, come back, put my watch on. It's like, oh, well, I'm 180. Go to the e- the ER there in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And it took them so long to check me in that by the time they put me on the bed, I had already converted out of it. They caught like the tail end when they put me on the monitor. Like I was coming down from like 170. And when they put me on the monitor, it was like, you know, 140 and then just kept on dropping. Sat there for a couple hours when the doctor comes in and says like, look, you know, I have this problem. I have a cardiologist in Huntsville. We're working on resolving this issue. I'm back to normal. You know, let's just go home. He's like, all right, that's fine. So I get discharged. And then earlier this year, I go into, well, no, it was uh, last year. I was in September because it was September 1st of uh, 2023. So I had an appointment with mental health at the VA. And so I've been like driving my wife back and forth because I don't work full time. So I'll take her to work, pick her up. So I woke up and I was like, ah, this don't feel good. So I go pick her up, bring her home. And I have an appointment at like eight o'clock with the VA. So I drive to the VA. I'm sitting there with my little watch and I'm looking, it's like 180. And I'm like, do I want to go in and speak with this psychiatrist for an hour or should I go to the hospital? So I ended up going to the to the hospital, called the VA, said, hey, I can't make my, my appointment. Went to Huntsville, checked in. And of course, you know, my heart rate's 180. I immediately get to bed. So I get put in D-Pod. And that's when I got the adenosin because they were just looking at it. It was like narrow. They did the 12 lead. It said AFib, but they went ahead and tried the adenosine anyways. So 6, 12, nothing changed. And they uh, said, well, we're calling Dr. Allison. He's an EP cardiologist, but he was putting in a pacemaker upstairs. So I had to wait four hours with like a heart rate of between 170 and 180. Man. For him to finish up his pacemaker placement on his patient and then come down and say, oh, yeah, we need to cardioavert him. Why wouldn't the ER physician just do it? I don't know. And which was weird because Dr. Krim, because Debbie was working in CPOD because she was training for the ER. And Dr. Krim cardioverted a patient with her. Like Debbie actually got to push the button. Mm -hmm. I begged them to just go ahead and cardiovert me. I said, you drag that monitor over a little closer, I'll cardiovert myself because I know how to do it. (laughs) And they're like, no, no, we got to wait for the cardiologist. I don't know why the ER doctor didn't want to do it. Yeah. How were you feeling after that long of being of being in it? Even at my age, you know, I'm 51, but sitting there, you know, I probably could not have run a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> but sitting there with a heart rate of 180 just laying on the bed, I mean, I couldn't even tell I was in that rhythm if I was being still. Now, if I got up, you know, and walked a little bit, you know, it's like, man, I feel tired, but Never had what you would think would be the the classic signs for somebody who was older. Right. Our youngest son, when he was like five or six, he was having, you know, rates up to almost 300. Really? Yeah. And he would he would never know it. Now, he's not my biological son. He's a stepson. But it wasn't until he got probably about 12 that he come to me one day and says, I like, I just don't feel good. You know, and then we we found out he was having SVTs and he ended up with an uh, ablation to fix that. That allowed him to join the military and be all he can be. Awesome. And all that. I wanted them to cardio for me and I didn't want them to sedate me. And they're like, why would you not want to be sedated? And it's like, I have to do this to patients. And if I have to do it to a patient, why can I not experience what they experience? And they weren't buying it. Ah. So they gave me some Versed and something else. I can't remember what it was, but I was like going, I'm going out. <laughs> A few minutes later, I woke up and they had cardioverted me and I was better. So no no memory of what it actually felt like? No, unfortunately. You know, that Versed, if you give it like really quick like that, it causes, you know, like short term amnesia. Right. You know, you push it, do something. And when that patient wakes up, Nine times out of 10, they're probably not going to remember anything that occurred after you push that medicine that quick. Sure. Sometimes if you can give it like you can ask questions and it's almost like a truth serum, it'll lower those inhibitions and you can ask questions and 
find out some stuff if you want. Yeah, I've always heard that uh, the way that benzodiazepines work is not unlike how alcohol works. You know, same receptors and similar effects. Yep. I don't disagree with the thought of behind, I mean, you should know what this feels like. They make the law enforcement people get tased and get sprayed by a pepper spray so they know what they're doing to people. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not saying we should go out, you know, because tasing and pepper spraying people is a lot safer than cardioverting somebody. That's that's a good point. But at the same time, if I have to be cardioverted, I want to know what it feels like. I want to remember it. Why not take the opportunity? Exactly. And they they just did not want to give me the opportunity. Would you have really done it yourself? Could you really push that button? Oh, I could have <laughs> and would have. I mean, I've been through so much as a paramedic and I've been through 23 years in the military. I would have had no problem dragging that thing close, charging it up, putting the sync button on and holding that button until it shocked me. I'm a little different, I guess, than most people. And the only reason I didn't do it was because I didn't want anybody to get fired at the hospital. Sure. I could have literally gotten off the bed, drug it over there and did it myself. But I value other people's job as well. Yeah. I mean, if they'd given me the option, I would have had no problem doing it myself. Charge it up, hear that whine, press and hold. <laughs> That's amazing. That would have been legendary. It would have. Unfortunately, I was denied. As long as you remember to hit that sync button first. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's the important button. Yeah, right. Is that the last time it's happened to you? Is that the last episode? No, uh, I had uh, another episode in January. We were in Disney World because our daughter was doing a destination wedding. Okay. And so we had went over to the hotel where she was getting ready at. And I was like walking over and it's like, oh man, this kind of feels like what it was like for my last episode. So I get over there, you know, daughter's getting ready. The rest of the family's getting ready for the wedding. And so I'm in like one of the bedrooms and I'm like looking at my watch and I'm like, crap, 180. It's that thing again. It's like, do I tough it out, do the daughter's wedding and then go get treatment or what do I do? Yeah. So I, I, I talked to Debbie. She says, Go back to the room, take your Motoparol, take my Motoparol, and see what happens. So I drive myself back over to our hotel because we were in a different hotel. And I'm like, this is going to take a while. So I went down to the ice machine, got two buckets of ice, filled up the sink, and filled it up with water so that like I had this sink full of ice water. And I literally stuck my face in the ice water till it hurt and kept on going. And probably within 30 seconds after that, I dropped from 170 to 120. Nice. Yeah. So ice immersion of the face does work. Can attest to that. Have you tried any other vagal maneuvers on yourself? The only other ones I've done was the like bearing down, you know, try to poop your pants, but don't. Or, you know, blow on your thumb like you're trying to blow up a straw. Sure. And <laughs> this is going to be really weird. And this was something... That was taught in ACLS a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> they are now starting to bring back the circumflex sweep of the anus as a method to mitigate SVT. I've never heard that before. Can you elaborate on what that is? Basically, you just stick your finger in the rectum and swirl it around. I really wish I still had the ACLS book from the first time that I took ACLS, because that literally was a vagal maneuver that was taught in ACLS the first time I took it. And now I read an article the other day that was talking about cardiologists and doctors talking about how the circumflex sweep of the anus can mitigate and you know, resolve the SVT. And I was like, that was 20 years ago. I was reading that in an ACLS book. That's incredible. I mean, I'm not making it up. You can Google it. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'm going to definitely look it up and put some information about it in the show notes for sure. Realistically, as a paramedic, <laughs> we are not going to do that. <laughs> a doctor may do that, but paramedics are not. <laughs> you could do it to yourself. That's, that's another thing to put in the toolbox. Well, that, that is true, but I think I'll stick with the ice water. <laughs> so you could cardiovert yourself, but not that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank you for telling me about that. I've never heard that before. Yeah. And a lot of people haven't, you know, been a paramedic 
got my license in 1998, you know, so took like the ACLS, I think in 97, you know, is how long ago that this ACLS book was, was written. That's good to know. I don't know who it's good to know for, but. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work with an anesthesiologist with sometimes in PACU, you know, people would go into SVT after surgery and he would come in there and push on their eyeballs to get it to stop. And it worked every time I saw him do it, every single time. He'd be like, yeah, this is going to hurt, which, you know, they, they were still halfway anesthetized, thank, thankfully. But uh, he would dig his thumbs into their into their eyeballs and they, they would convert. Like right in the into the inside or directly? I saw him do it several times. I think just right on front and center. Ooh, wow. I mean, I mean, that would be a good, uh, you know, hey, are you a responsive check? <laughs> yeah, definitely. One thing that I always like to do to check for responsiveness was the uh, jaw thrust because, hey, you, you know, you want to make sure the patient's airway is open. And let me tell you, you grab that angle right there and you pull. If they're unresponsive, I mean, that airway is going to open, you know, and you're good. If, if they're kind of pretending a little bit, you put some pressure on that angle of that jaw. They're not going to pretend for very long. Yeah, that's a win-win. It seems like your episodes have happened during times of higher stress or physical exertion. Do you feel like that? Do you feel like those are reliable triggers, or is there anything else you've identified that might be a trigger? Probably just the the higher stress and maybe a little bit of dehydration it was kind of the precursors for the wedding. I mean, that was that was very stressful. We're all running around. We're doing this. We're doing that. I haven't drunk enough water. You know, we're trying to get everybody to where they need to be. You know, so stress plays into it, but kind of also like hydration. I think sometimes, you know, we're all kind of guilty of not drinking enough water. I've kind of, i not really big on the, the caffeine because I, I found that like if I drink too much caffeine, that's kind of, kind of bad as well. So kind of cut back on caffeine, probably drink a cup of coffee, maybe two or three times a month if that. Don't drink caffeinated, you know, soft drinks or anything. Any family history of heart stuff that would have led you to think you might be more prone to that? My mom has always had like some type of ar arrhythmia. She's always taken a tenanol for her heart and she has mitral valve prolapse. Okay. I've never been diagnosed with mitral valve prolapse. You know, and like I said, you know, I've had so much cardiac stuff that if I had it, the four cardiologists that I've seen so far would have known. I've had stress tests, I've had echocardiograms, I've had, you know, the CTAs. I just got my appointment for my ablation in March, so March 14th. Okay. And I kind of found something interesting about what they do when they do the ablations that I didn't know. It's And it, for AFib, it's kind of different than it is for like SVT. When you have SVT, there's generally a point in your heart that causes the episodes. And so they induce with medication for you to have the SVT, and then they go in and they just kind of zap that point of the heart. Well, I was talking with Dr. Tabaro, you know, about this procedure and how it was going to occur. And basically what they do is, is they go in and they, like all of the major vessels that come into the atria for the heart, that's where they're going to do the ablation, because apparently that's where the AFib comes from. Not a single point in the heart. Like they're literally going to do it like an ablation around like all of the the vessels of my heart. Okay. And that was something that was kind of new to me because I thought AFib maybe started at one point of the heart, but apparently it's not actually the heart. It's the, the vessels coming into the heart that cause the issue. And that's what they're going to ablate when they go in and do the procedure. Are you an AFib at baseline or do you do you go back into sinus rhythm? No, I go back into uh, sinus rhythm. So like if you were to put me on a 12 lead right now, I would show sinus rhythm with a short PR. Okay. My P wave is almost directly attached to my R wave. Okay. <laughs> so I, I have a, a really short PR interval. Gotcha. I think this episode will come out after your ablation. So if you, if you want, we can get back together after you have that and you can uh, update us and tell us how it went. I can. I mean, I have no problem doing that. Or take a recorder in there and just record the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I wish. <laughs> I mean, this is not like general surgery. You know, like when they do this, it's almost like conscious sedation. You're mostly unresponsive. 
but not really. They give you the verse head and, you know, a couple of other things. They don't knock you out and give you the paralytics like they do with, like, if they're doing, like, actual surgery. Yeah, like the same as you get for, like, an EGD or colonoscopy, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd want to be recording what I'd be saying then. Oh, that truth serum, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hear all kinds of things I don't want heard. <laughs> Does having this affect your military service at all? Not really at at this point. I have, you know, other issues that are kind of affecting my military service. A little bit of mental health, a little bit of weight. Okay. But as far as like this atrial problem, uh, not so much right now, but if I don't get it taken care of, it will. Because even now, if I try to exert myself really hard, I feel short of breath. Okay. I don't know if that's from the AFib or what, but, you know, from having the the, the sustained heart rates, or maybe I'm just, you know, overweight and out of shape. But get this procedure done, try to get back in shape a little bit, and hopefully I can continue my military career be able to have at least eight more years if I can. If not, then November will give me 23 years and I can retire. Gotcha. It won't be a big hit on my military career, you know, because I had the time in and, you know, they can't take my retirement away from me unless I'm really egregious on something. Okay. You know, it is what it is. If I can stay in, I will. If not, then I get out. Has it had any kind of psychological effect on you? Just, just knowing that you have this? No, not really. The only thing sometimes is like, you know, if I'm doing something that's like, oh, man, is this going to cause an episode? It's not that I worry about it. I don't sit and dwell on it. I mean, it kind of is what it is. If it happens, I'm not concerned, you know, being medical and knowing what's going on, I can take care of it. And if I can't take care of it, then I know I can just go to the hospital and let them take care of it. Sure. So, you know, it doesn't bother me that way. Anything different you would do as a provider now taking care of patients with this now that you now that you have the experience with it? I won't say that there's anything I would do different. You know, I've always been diligent when taking care of patients of matching their vital signs with their symptoms, with their their rhythm. And as a provider, I mean, that's really what you have to do is you don't just go by with what the monitor says, what their vitals are. If you're looking at your patient and they look gray, they're sweaty. But, you know, but maybe their blood pressure is like 130, you know, over something. I mean, regardless of whether their blood pressure is that, something is going on. Some people exhibit different symptoms at different vital signs. And you just, you have to look at your patient and evaluate what is going on with the patient, how the patient is feeling, you know, and do you think that the patient is telling, you know, the truth? But I mean, if you're looking at them and they're diaphoretic, like you're watching little sweat beads pop up on their forehead. I mean, something's going on regardless of what the monitor is saying. So look into it, delve a little deeper. Don't give up. Make sure you treat your patient and not your monitor. Yeah, great advice. It's hard to fake sweating. You can fake a lot of stuff, but uh, not diaphoresis. No. A, a little story about that was back when I first became a paramedic, I was transporting a dissecting aortic aneurysm from Hartsville Medical Center to Huntsville Hospital, and we were transitioning off of I-65 onto 565, and I literally started watching sweat beads pop up on this guy's forehead. The only thing that was missing was the little sound effect of beep, 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 because <laughs> I, I literally could count them as they were popping up. Yeah. And I, I told the driver, I said, I don't care if you have to stick your foot in the engine compartment and manipulate the carburetor with your toes. <laughs> you need to drive faster. How did that turn out? He lived till he got to the hospital. I don't know if he lived after that because I'm, I think he went into cardiac arrest after we got him there. Yikes. Yeah. So I did what I could do. And that was diesel and O2. Sounds like you got him there just in time. There there was nothing else I could do for him. Yeah, sure. You know, especially watch, watching those little sweat beads pop up. But yeah, you're right. You can't fake sweating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a patient that he had an aortic dissection. And be because of the way it affected the, you know, where the carotids and the subclavian and all that come off the aorta, the, the way it affected him is it presented like a stroke. He ended up having, you know, one-sided weakness. Right. And so they gave him TPA. 
not realizing what was going on. <laughs> Once that happened, Huntsville wouldn't even somehow they did figure it out. And Huntsville was like, nope, not touching it. You know, so he had to go to Birmingham and he found somebody that was willing to fix him. And they did. But uh, I, I always remember that as a bad potential presentation of aortic dissection that might fool you. I mean, there's there's a lot of atypical things that happen, you know, with like the aorta and stuff like that. And I know we're a little off topic on this, but I worked with a, a paramedic one time and we went with I was uh, intermediate at the time and I was working with the paramedic. We went to a head on collision and the guy says like, oh, my chest is, just feels like it's like this real bad tearing cessation going on in here. And so my medic, he's like, OK. He says, we're not C-spining this guy. We'll put a collar on him, but we're going to sit him up. And this was, you know, this was back in like 98, you know, 97. So this was way before, you know, they ever said, hey, we're not doing the boards anymore. Yeah. And so we drive him to Decatur and Decatur's all pissed off because we don't have him in full C-spine precautions. You know, and the, the medic tried to tell him it's like what was going on. And they're like, eh, we know what we're doing. They laid the guy flat, and as soon as they did, he coded. Oh, man. There were, there was something about, like, with him sitting up, kept a certain amount of pressure someplace. Yeah. And it, it may not have been that he would have survived at all, you know, regardless. But as soon as they laid him down and took that pressure off of, you know, his abdomen, he went unresponsive and coded pretty much almost immediately. Wow. He was up. He was talking. A no times three all the way to the hospital from the scene of the accident till they laid him down. Wow. And then he did not survive that that incident. Gosh. I hope your partner got to say a big ol' I told you so. Yeah. Well, we, we knew better. <laughs> <laughs> Any advice for patients in your situation if anybody is dealing with tachycardia issues as a patient? Just know your body. Know when something changes. It's kind of hard to give patients, you know, advice as far as heart rates and stuff like that, because they don't have the knowledge to know. Maybe they do have an app watch and they can like stick their finger on it. It's like, oh, my God, you know, what's this? It's not going to tell them. It just when I do mine, it doesn't tell me anything other than it's like, oh, your heart rate's high. Sure. But basically, it's it's know your body. Know that if you are experiencing any type of chest pain or shortness of breath, go to the ER and get checked out because you don't know what's going on. You don't have the medical skills to diagnose yourself or ferret out what is what is happening. And I will also say that if there are any veterans who are listening, that you do not have to call the VA to get permission to go to the ER for chest pain or shortness of breath. You can go straight to the ER and if you're a VA patient, the VA will take care of your bill. And if you need to be transferred, there's a nice gentleman there named Keith who will help you get to the VA facility you need. That's great advice. Is that I take it that's not true for every condition? You can't go to the ER as a VA patient if you have a cold. Okay. That's where you call your primary care at the VA and they get you in to be seen. But life-threatening conditions are covered if you go to the ER without calling. Because I have gone to the VA and picked up patients who have had chest pain for five days because they thought that they had to go to the VA clinic first before they went to the ER. So if you have life-threatening conditions, like you're short of breath, you're having chest pain, you check your blood sugar and your monitor reads high, those are things that you can go to straight to the ER and you don't have to go to the VA clinic to get seen for. Got you. That's wonderful. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And, you know, every patient that I picked up that had chest pain, shortness of breath, I made sure to tell them, look, I'm a vet. I work with the VA as well. You don't have to wait for life saving treatment. Anything else you want to throw out there? Anything else? What, what didn't I ask you that I should have asked you? I don't think we skipped anything. I think we, uh, I think we hit all the the highlights and the the main pertinent points. Even kind of meandered off the the path less traveled. That's the best part. It can be. That is true. All right. Well, Luke Pike, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate your time, and uh, I, I would love an update after your ablation happens. Well, it's not a problem, Jody. I will be more than happy to uh, send you an email and uh, 
kind of let you know how the procedure went. And then maybe we can catch up in a month or two and see if I've had any more episodes or anything. Yeah, that sounds great. I would love that. All right. Well, I do appreciate you having me on. Uh, hope everybody who is listening has a, uh, a good day from here on out. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I hope you do, too. All right. Bye. Thank you again to my guest, Luke Pike. What a great interview. He's a freaking superhero. I feel like there's hundreds of hours of podcast material in there somewhere. Maybe I can get some more of it out of him in the future. We'll touch base with Luke again after he has his ablation, and he can tell us what that was like and hopefully tell us about how it completely worked and he has not had any more episodes. But wish him well with that. Hope everything goes well, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for listening to Knowledgeable Provider. Please be sure to like, subscribe, or follow on your preferred listening platform. Give us a nice five-star rating and leave a nice review. If you'd like to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash knowledgeable provider. And as always, stay safe, take care of yourself, and take care of your patients in that order. Thank you.